Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Debrief. This is Pastor Matt Brown again, uh, filling in for the lovely Stephanie and Jono. Uh, I am doing all the questions today, asking, and uh, I'm here with my good friend, the PMD, Pastor Mark Driscoll. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you for being here for us. Pastor Mark flew out here, uh, like we said last week, if you missed uh, the last debrief. Uh, he is also going through the book of Galatians and uh, really, really focusing on on how uh, God creates and Satan counterfeits. And we are in the series called Confused, and we want you to have gospel clarity, uh, clarity on the life that you are called to live, and just clarity on literally uh, what it means to be saved and how to share the gospel. So we're super excited you guys are uh, listening along, and I want to encourage you to send in all of your questions, and I won't be getting to any of uh, them uh, today because this is pre-recorded. wanted to let you know that Pastor Mark is sitting down with me before we started this series, but fire those questions away. At some point, we'll get after those uh, super excited. So, uh, Pastor Mark, uh, thanks for being here again yeah, today. Love you, buddy. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, man, we, we kind of got all the way up to uh, Galatians chapter three. Um, let's just kind of summarize again for our listeners. God creates Satan counterfeits. Um, and um, I think that that creates a lot of confusion morally, spiritually, and even uh, related to churches. You know, what, what do churches believe and not believe? And uh, for those of you watching online, I'm wearing glasses because I had to confess to Pastor Mark, I cannot see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're both just laughing about getting older. And, uh, you know, Mark, I tell our church all the time, you know that you're old when you transition from, or you're getting old, when you transition from a participant to a watcher. Hmm. You know, like, so I see something my son's doing. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to watch that. I'm oh, I had that the other day. We went yeah. to the friend's house and they had a huge trampoline. Yeah. And my oldest son's jumping and they're on the trampoline right. and I'm watching and I'm thinking, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I might have been on the trampoline yeah. today. There's a better odds of me being pregnant than being on a trampoline. <laughs> you know, I'm just, that's, a, I'm not going to take that risk. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, man, great way to... Uh, Inter interject into this show, uh, you might be pregnant. Did you hear about the uh, man that went to the hospital this last week? Did you read the article? No. He went to the hospital and he was treated for high blood pressure um, and actually uh, gave birth uh, uh, moments later because of the high blood pressure medication. And um, this is sad, not funny at all, but the, the medication that they gave him actually uh, caused the child to be born stillborn. The reason that happened was because on all of his medical papers, he is listed as a man, ah. even though biologically he's a woman. And so the 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 uh, yeah. hospital is at a loss because- They weren't checking for that. Right. They weren't checking for that. And so if you're a woman, uh, and all women know this, whenever you go to the doctors and there's any medication involved, one of the first questions they ask is there any chance that you're pregnant? And sometimes they don't even take your word for it. Um, they make you uh, take a pregnancy test to determine if that's the case. And in some cases, they they mandate that you're on the pill to prevent you from being pregnant because medicines can do yeah. terribly uh, awful things to babies that are in your womb. And so literally there's this big debate and the hospital's like, we did nothing wrong because he is listed as a man. And so this is just how confused our culture is. I mean, literally we have said, you're not God, I'm God, and you didn't create me the right way. So I'm going to recreate myself the right way regardless of the consequence. I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. um, not that our society particularly cares about the life of the unborn, but that certainly matters to me. And I think ultimately matters to the trans, is it trans, do you say trans male? Is that how you say it? I don't know. I what don't you know. Say. I went to public school. I don't know a lot. Yeah. So I think the person wanted to have the pregnancy or I'm not sure I, I need to do the research and I'm sure I'm going to get lovely emails regarding all the information upon that, but that it's a problem. And so that's the thing is the further we get away from truth, the more confused mm -hmm. we are as a culture. And, and so much of our culture is hatred towards the gospel, um, towards Jesus, towards Christianity is they don't want to repent. They don't want to be told. Uh, you said it in our last episode, the problems in our pants and what we want to do with our sexual motives and our desires and, and literally those impulses that really make us more animal than they do angelic. And God has called us to be different. So we're going to jump in. And I know you weren't ready for that opening story. Hey, hey there we go. <laughs> yeah. But um, man, our world is screwed up. And if you're a parent, you need to understand that your kids are growing up in this world where literally everything is upside down and your kids are going to have to navigate that. And the best way to help them navigate it is to know the true gospel, to know the true God 
and to know how to rightly handle the true word of God. And, and really that's what Galatians is all about. It's about setting the table right again because some people have got confused because of cultural pressures that have come in and people are saying, hey, it, you know, you need to remain Jewish culturally if you're going to follow Christ. And, and our church has heard me say, you don't have to become Jewish to follow Jesus. But too, uh, you know, in our day, it would be, um, you know, there was a Jewish version of Jesus and there's an American version right. of Jesus. Yeah. So and talk so, about that. Yeah. So it's like in their day, it was, hey, we're Jewish. And if you want Jesus, you need to have the Jewish version. Today, our American version of Jesus is, is, you know, basically he's a long haired community college prof who has no judgment, has no right. morals, um, has no authority and is just kind of like a permissive parent that right. loves everybody, blesses them and lets them pursue what they believe is in their best interest. Mm. And that's kind of the American Jesus. He's, yeah. he's the permissive parent. Right. How do you think we got here? Cause we weren't there. Right. I mean, think about Jonathan Edwards and I've, I just had a friend who went to his church and there's like 11 Christians in that area where the great awakening took place. Yeah, I mean, his was sinners in the hands of an angry right. God and now it's God in the hands of angry sinners. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's flipped. Now yeah. we're like, God, you're bigoted, intolerant, judgmental, narrow, old school, outdated, masculine. So mm. it's God in the hands of angry sinners is where we find ourselves today. Yeah. When's the last time you read Revelation? I actually just finished a book on spiritual warfare with my wife, Grace, and the whole last chapter mm. was on Revelation. Yeah. Have you ever thought about, you know, like when all the, all the wrath is poured out you yeah. know, like, and you're like, who are these idiots that are lining up against God in that final battle? Yeah. It's like, I, I don't know about you, but I'm switching sides. Like if you and I are, you got your, your Mark Driscoll armor on and I got my Matt Brown, you know, leatherette outfit on. <laughs> and Jesus on a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth, you know, and he's, his, his robes dripped in blood. I'm like, Hey, Mark, <laughs> yeah. wrong side, but you know, you know, I mean, I, right. See, that's where I think though, that Satan is not only the deceiver, I think he's self-deceived. Yeah. It's like, I've read the mm. Bible and it says he loses, but he keeps fighting. Right. It seems like he thinks he can rewrite it. Mm. And that again, to come back to Galatians, he, he talks about who has bewitched you. That's mm. demonic spirits. If we are an angel from heaven, that's a demonic spirit. There are demonic things going on in every age. They're getting us to think, you know what? The You know, God said it, but there is an opportunity to rewrite it. Mm. And I think that's what's going on in Galatians. God said it, but we can rewrite it. I think it's going on in our own culture. God said it, but we can rewrite it. And yeah. there's always this, you know, God's looking for messengers, not editors, but there's always people that are nominating mm. themselves to be God's editors. Mm. Yeah, let me ask you this question. So I got uh, I got a direct message. Uh, please don't send me those, by the way. Um, I, I usually decline, just so you guys know, because there are way too many. But for whatever reason, I, I screwed up because I'm not real techie. And I read the question and the gal said, uh, she was confronted by a group of Muslim men and they said, your Bible was written by men. Ours was written directly from God. We really didn't talk about last week, but really Galatians two is all about where Paul's message came from. Yeah, It did not come from man. He man. says Galatians. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't come from man. Right. It came from God. Yeah. Directly. And, yeah. uh, and it was, and then he went to Jerusalem and he, he met with James, the brother of the Lord, he says, and he met with Peter and they confirmed over the course of 15 days. So God communicates, man confirms. Right. Um, and, and the problem is when somebody says, God told me, but nobody's confirming that. Mm. That's where you get spiritual abuse or demonic activity. Ooh, say that again. I when, some, when somebody says, God told me, but nobody's confirmed it, that's where we get spiritual abuse. That's where we get spiritual abuse and demonic activity. Mm. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and so, you know, God does communicate, but he mm. uses leadership to confirm. So even Paul, who spent three years, he tells us in Galatians, meeting with the Lord, getting direct revelation, then went to Jerusalem mm. to have Jesus' brother and Peter um, confirm what Jesus communicated to him. That, right. So there is no higher authority than a guy like Paul, but he also is under authority mm -hmm. and he and it confirms that that his, his authority is from God. Right. And then Peter says, and I think it's second Peter, um, that that he says some people try to twist the teachings of Paul as they do the other, other scriptures. Because he says some things that Paul says are, quote, hard to understand. So Peter's like, man, I hung out with Jesus three years and Paul sent a letter and it gave me a headache, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> well, one was a fisherman. The other was like, you know, a Harvard professor. Right? Yeah. But you start to think about, we're still getting headaches with Paul. Predestination, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. head coverings, women in ministry, speaking in right. tongues. You're yeah. like, 
baptism for the dead. You're like, oh, God. yeah, yeah. I mean, does it, so just because the Bible to you isn't maybe clear doesn't mean it's not true. Right. And that's what Peter says. Peter says, man, I learned stuff from Paul and some of the stuff that Paul tells me, you know, it takes me a while to figure out. Right. Yeah. But he, but he calls hope. it scripture. Yeah. He calls it yeah, as they do the other scriptures. Yeah. I think it's second Peter three, 14 to yeah. 15. It's right in mm-hmm. there. So, yeah. yeah, but that's just important. And so, you know, a lot of you Christians, I mean, you're literally one uncomfortable comp- conversation at the beach with some Muslim evangelists, which, and let me just say this, if they were truly Muslim evangelists, they wouldn't be talking to a female alone. I mean, they just- On a beach. On a beach. So- Most devout Muslims are right. not real beach goers. Right. So, so that just tells you there's a problem right there. But I mean, she was completely distraught. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. And, and, and let me just say this, the, the, the best thing you can do for yourself is just to admit you don't know anything and to start learning and start studying. Because even Peter got confused and he says, yeah, there's some confusing things, but look, this dude, Paul, man, he's heard from God and the apostles confirm that. Yeah, He's confirmed as, yep, you hear from God. And this guy, he said, I, he went so that to make sure that he didn't, uh, what does he say? anything needed to be added or I wasn't missing anything. And he said, nope, you're not. And so he says, okay. And then I, I came back and I'm preaching the gospel. Um, and again, it's just so important. I heard from God. I went into Arabia for however long that is. You know, then I went up to Jerusalem and I meet with a couple of guys and now I'm back. But look, this gospel is is once delivered, I think as Jude says. yeah, It's once delivered for the saints and, it, and it's unchanging. But we need to have confidence in the word of God. And so many people today say, well, it's just written by men. So what would you say to that? I'd say number one, who's going to make up this story? We're all bad, can't save or fix ourselves and left unto ourselves. Everyone is kindling forever. Right. First is just the message. Yeah. I mean, because I can get, uh, there's a lot of gods. I can get, you're a good person. I get, you can pay God back. There is no hope. Right. And you are the problem, not the solution. I mean, just the message of the gospel is, I am the problem. I am not the solution. Right. I mean, that's that's radical. Everything right. in our world is someone else is the problem mm-hmm. and you're the solution. Right. So blame your temperament, your culture, your personality, your genetics. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a victim. Right. Uh, but you can have self-help, self-love, self-improvement, self-actualization. They're the problem. You're the solution. That's right. everything in the whole world. Right. To say you are the problem. Right. And uh, and everyone else is the problem, and no one is the mm. solution, and no one has the solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mean, no. It's it, it it's that's whack. offensive. That's why the gospel is offensive. Right. That's offensive. It's like you're saying we're all screwed up. Yes. That's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. More than we know. And and unless a miracle happens, we're all kindling. That's exactly what we're mm-hmm. saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you read uh, Jordan Peterson's Twelve Rules for Life? No. So it's interesting. So he he is what I would call a, a classical liberal. Uh, so he doesn't believe in the gospel, but he believes in the necessity of the gospel. And what he's saying is, until a person truly understands how bad they are, they will never comprehend the good that they can be. Hmm. And um, so he sees the gospel as as a metaphor, but he sees it as a necessity uh, for guiding and directing our culture. And so as we've rejected this gospel, our culture is is just imploding. Um, and it, but, but he's not a Christian. Yeah. Um, he you know if he goes to church, he does he does so for smells and bells. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but just, just tremendous, tremendous book and really speaking culturally. And it's interesting. People think he's a right wing conservative nut job. He's like, uh, I'm liberal, but that's how, that's how quickly our culture has shifted. Yeah. Um, you know, liberals have just been jumped over, you know, leaped over and, and we've gone completely leftist. And, and literally you see these guys going, wait, what a minute. I thought I was a classical liberal. And I'm like, no, you you love Trump. He's like, oh uh, no. So that's what's happening because we've rejected, you know, but if you're going to accept the good news, right, there's really bad news. And the bad news is, man, you're sick. You know, it's worse than that. You're dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunate, right? If you're in the ER. Spiritually, <laughs> you're dead. Yeah. You know what dead people do? Nothing. Right. You know what dead people choose? Nothing. You know what dead people fix? Nothing. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like Lazarus in the tomb. The King James says he stinketh. That's yeah. where you start spiritually. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and that's an uncomfortable place to go because nobody wants to hear that. But it's the one thing that makes sense. Cause if we're all good and getting better, why does it suck so bad? Right. Like I look at the world and it's not like, well, you know, 
boy, it thinks are really trending in the most encouraging. Lo- I mean, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control. I just see it everywhere. I see the progress we're making. I yeah. I see the love and unity and harmony and joy and generosity. Yeah. I mean, this world is a dumpster fire meets prison riot meets drunk driving rollover. Yeah. And if we're good people who are evolving and getting better, why is it getting worse? Mm -hmm. And to say, oh, there is a real enemy that is against God and and the people that he made. There is a real evil that exists within you. And that evil is not something that you can solve. Mm -hmm. And all culture is, is the collection of a whole bunch of evil people empowered by an evil force. Mm -hmm. And that never results in good things. Right. So if that's the storyline of the Bible, it's the one thing that actually makes sense with reality. It's why we've got, you know, a password on our laptop and phone and why we've got a a lock on our front door and an airbag in our car. We don't think that people are safe and the world's okay. Right. Right. So, so why do we, well, I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask anyways. So why do we have such a hard time uh, believing the gospel as non-Christians and then uh, proclaiming it as Christians? Like, right, so let's start with non-Christians. Why is it so hard for non-Christians to get this? Paul has this crazy line in Galatians where he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Right. And what that literally means is that there was somebody who was spiritual but not Christian Mm. And they were, you know, we have prayers, uh, they have spells. Mm -hmm. And what he's literally saying is, it's like a spell has been cast and you're all just out of it. Mm. You know, if you've ever seen somebody that's high on medication or something, they're in an altered state, you're just like, they are not there. They're not making any sense. They're not, they're not in reality. Mm -hmm. And I can't communicate with them. When there is a spirit of confusion, when there is a demonic spirit of deception, mm-hmm. it's it's like people are high. Right. They're not in their right mind. They're mm-hmm. not thinking and reasoning and 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 realizing reality. They're mm-hmm. not. Yeah. And what he's saying is there are powerful spiritual forces at work. And you think about that in our world. I mean, this is a very confused, very self-destructive, very rebellious age that is tremendously supernatural. Right. Aliens superheroes, you know, formal religions like Wicca are making a significant comeback, general spirituality of all sorts and kinds. I mean, people are very attuned to the supernatural, to the paranormal, to the spiritual, uh, but they're not seeing Jesus and they're not doing better. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Why don't you think, why do you think Christians were so afraid to speak truth into this just web of lies and just, I mean, people, people know deep down that, that you know, like it, it's, that's not the case. Like, well, you, you, the evidence is all around us. Why, why as Christians are we afraid? Cause I guess, you know, the Christians of Galatians were bewitched. So how, how have we been bewitched then? Well, I think for us, we know that as soon as you say I'm a Christian, then immediately the first thing that comes is hypocrisy. You're all right. a bunch of hypocrites. You're all a bunch of money grubbers right. and philanderers and, you know, and shell game players. And so the the best way to share the gospel is not to say, let me talk about your sin, but I think it's starting by saying, let me talk about my sin. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about the regrets I have, the things that I've done. In fact, let me tell you about some of the things that I thought were really good Mm -hmm. because I'm a winner, not a loser. And they were harmful to other people. And then uh, God Mm. changed my heart and he revealed to me my independence, my stubbornness, Mm -hmm. my selfishness, my self-righteousness, my brokenness. Mm. And he came and healed that and he fixed that. And he's still working on me and I'm still a work in progress. Mm. And I'm not a hypocrite. I'm somebody who's halfway through their rehab. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I do love Jesus and you're going to see the faults, flaws and failures in my life. And here's the good news. We're saved by grace. Mm. Yeah. Which is how I got in. Yeah. And so I think it's by less, you know, let me stand up and talk about your sin. Let me stand up and talk about my sin and let me talk about God's grace. And then maybe you'll talk to me about your sin. Mm -hmm. And then I could talk to you about God's grace for your sin. Right. Mm -hmm. But most of us don't want to stand up and say, okay, here's who I really am. Right. And Paul says, I'm the chief among all sinners. And this must be accepted by everyone. Yeah. Right. It's without debate. Yeah. He's like, I am valedictorian of losers. Right. But he was the most religious, devout, zealous, committed guy. And so sincerity doesn't indicate correction. I mean, you you can be profoundly committed to something that's wrong. Right. Oh, well, look at, think about Osama bin Laden, right? The guy was profoundly committed to what he believed was true. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, Islam means fully submitted ones or or Muslim. Fully surrendered. Fully surrendered. So I'm fully surrendered to the will of God and I'm going to follow that out. And, you know, it's just so, so interesting. And I don't want to put the guy down at all, but you know, when, you know, he's married to three women locked up in a house and they found his computer full of porn. Mm Mm-hmm. Because no matter how devout you are, right, your your devotion to what you believe is true in the end, it just really is hostile to everyone. And that's what Paul was. And I'm not saying yet. He was a full. religious terrorist. Yes. He was a religious zealot terrorist. That and, that's and, he would have been on the watch list today. Yeah, and that's what happens when you're right and everybody is wrong. Right. Well, and when you are God and you're going to judge them mm-hmm. and and then you're going to damn them. But yeah. let's just say that Paul's not the only one that does it. We do this all the time. Liberals yeah. do it with conservatives. Conservatives do it with liberals, pro-life, pro-choice. There are, there are all these issues and everybody online right now is trying to convene a court, serve yeah. as God, render a verdict and sentence someone to some consequence. And yeah. it's like, and look, what, what, look what's happened. Not only is a great portion of our society society going to hell, but we're all in hell. Like, yeah, we're interning. Like for example, oh my gosh. So, you know, I, I don't know how many times you preached on Easter weekend, but I'm done. Right. So I'm done. So we're I'm going a to... church planner. I had two and I went out to brunch. It was oh, amazing. You, um, okay. Now I'm judging you. So I preach five times. I'm gassed. And so we go to my mom's house. Right. And, and, and the two political idiots find each other, right. The one on the left, the one on the right. Oh, yeah. And I literally just said at the table, I told my wife, I said, the idiots have found one another. We are gone. And it's just like, not, not only, not only like, are you guys maybe going to hell, but you've just, you've just put Easter Sunday in hell. I, yeah. I don't want to be here. And we're family. <laughs> yeah. Like we're, we're family. I haven't seen you in two years. I got to leave, you know? And it's because of this self-righteousness and this, I have the information and I'm going to, yeah, oh my gosh. It's like, can we just eat ham? And see, that's <laughs> the spirit in Galatians. If you read the story, the prodigal son, there's the younger brother and the older brother. Right. A lot of Galatians is about the older brother. Mm. I do the right thing. I have the right position. I work very hard. If everyone would just shut up and agree with me, the world would be a better place. Right. And there's a little brother in all of us and there's a big brother in all of us. Mm-hmm. There's parts of us that want to be rebellious. There's parts of us that want to be religious and judgmental and self-righteous. And it got so bad in Galatians, they went older brother on Paul and were saying that Paul was the foolish, silly little right. brother. I mean, right. you know, you've really graduated when you're looking down on Paul. Yeah. Oh, man. yeah, dude, we're all nuts. All right. What does it mean in Galatians 3.24 that the law, ooh, this is one of my favorite ones, that the law was the guardian until Christ. I love this passage and it's 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 kind of tough. So the King James translates it as teacher, which is not really what the word means. So babysitter, nanny, coach. Yes. Yeah. Oh, coffee has just come. Amen. We love Thank you, you Stephanie. Thank, Thank you. you. I, you've got, I've got five kids. I know you got kids. Uh, when my kids were little, we had to manage them constantly. Mm-hmm. And especially little boys, they're all suicidal. <laughs> I, I told my wife, our kids have one job every day, and that's to kill themselves. And yeah. our job is to... <laughs> sons, uh, sons, it's, ha- having a son is living on suicide watch for a certain number of years. Right. If it's sharp, blows up, oh. plugs in, um, or is high up, that's what they're going for. Right. And so what he's saying is when you're little, you need a lot of rules. You need a yeah. small environment. You need high control and somebody who is managing you because you can't manage yourself. Amen. And then what he's saying is, is as you get older... You start to get a little more freedom, make your right. own decisions, take care of yourself. The goal is to get you, uh, as a parent, to get a child to the place where they're, they're, uh, they're, they have self-control, to use the language of right. relations. They can govern themselves. They can manage themselves. They don't need an ankle bracelet. They right. don't need you know, a jail cell. Uh, they don't need a random drug test. Right. right? Uh, they don't need a probation officer. They can govern themselves. And so what he's, what he's saying there is, and in that culture too, the father would decide at what point you became mature, right? Because when you were legally declared mature in the Roman empire, you would get all the inheritance rights of the family. Think about how much more helpful that would be in our society. You're like, you're 16. No, 18. No, 21. No, it's based on character, right? Not age. And Mm. that's part of the problem in our culture. Like, well, they're 18. They're an adult. They get to make all their own decisions. We're like, well, that didn't go so well. Yeah. We invented a word in my house. It's called adultish. Adultish. Yeah. (laughs) 
And we have a whole culture that's yeah. adultish. They right. have adult freedoms and childlike um, right. self-control and wisdom. And so the the goal then is the point is that God's goal is to get us to be filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, to where we don't need to be getting told what to do all the time by other people, uh, that we could figure it out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so what happens though, is religious people, critical people, law-minded people, judgmental people, rule-based people, they seem like the mature ones because they're so serious and they got it all figured out. But for them, the Christian life is like Ikea furniture paint by numbers kit. Yeah. And there's no relationship with God. There's no Mm -hmm. working it out with God. There's no being filled with the spirit, seeking wise counsel. And, and what they're trying to do, religious people, they try to replace the Holy Spirit in your life. Yeah. So he spends the first half of the book hammering against religious people who want to control you. And his answer isn't, therefore, have no control right. and live out of control. He moves to be controlled by the Spirit. Amen. Have a personal relationship with God where he leads you and guides you. And you don't need somebody bossing you around all the time. The Holy Spirit's there for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So think about this as a, as a parent. Um, we got a lot of, so our culture, right. Does the exact opposite. There is no tutor. There is no guardian. No, let your you kid, raise yourself, let your kid do whatever you want, follow their inhibitions. And then we're frustrated because they can't control themselves as an adult. And so a, a parent's job, right. You're, you're that law early on. Yes, no, right, wrong. But what you're ultimately interested in at some point is their heart. Yeah. Like I, I need, I need you to see why this is wrong. I it's need relational. you to see what right is right. And, and hopefully as, as a parent, your child is going to repent of their sins, place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then the spirit of God is going to come inside them and, you know, and allow them. And so like I had, man, one of the best experiences I had with my son, you know, parenting is rough. It's just rough. And I just, when I see my mom all the time, I'm just like, I'm sorry. She's like, for what? I'm like, everything. Like yeah. I, I'm everything. I, um, I remember one time in particular, uh, my wife was crying because of something my girls did and uh, not to throw my girls under the bus cause they're awesome. But I remember when I came back from the army and I was hard, I was hard hearted, right? I mean, the army doesn't make you soft. It makes you law based, not grace based. And I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, I remember, I mean, one of the things that you do is you stab tires and yell at it die. I mean, right. I mean, that's the training that you're that you're going under, and I just was in a bad place spiritually. I was far, I was running from God, and I, my mom my mom was so great and wanted to spend time, and I just I don't know what I said, I don't know what I did, but my mom could not, um, she could she could not control her emotions, and she just started sobbing. And we're driving in this Jeep that my parents helped me buy, right? Because I'm a total a hole. And we're on our way to Birdcage Mall. I'll never forget it. And my mom is sobbing so uncontrollably. I've hurt her so badly. And I realized I didn't need, I didn't need someone to say, you, you did it. I had the spirit of God inside me. And I just realized, Matt, you, you're a jerk and you're wrong. And it was the fir- it was the first time as an adult where I just I just had to say to my mom, I said, I am so sorry for what I've done. And like, I, I mean, she's got snot running down her face. I mean, she's sobbing because her son's been away in the army. She's terrified. You know, oh, yeah. boys of her generation didn't come home. So or if she, they did, they were perverted yeah, or broken yeah. or PTSD. Yeah. Or, and yeah. so, you know, and she's just, I'll never forget it. But that was the spirit of God in me. And, and listen to me, parents. Uh, I, I heard that same spirit when I was at a party and everybody's drinking. And I heard God say, what are you doing here? Mm-hmm. Nobody's telling me, hey, you're not, you're not, you're not of age, or there's people that are not. It's the spirit of God guiding me and controlling me. It was the spirit of God who who said, hey, you need to go to church. And my girlfriend's like, what, what, why would we do that? And it was the spirit of God who connected me with great glory and said, hey, you need to give your life to Christ. You need to make a change. And so the the, the job of the parent is to, you know, to be that lawgiver, but the point is to release them into God's hands so that they do the right thing. And so I've been t- telling that to my son. And you know, th- the thing with the internet now, it's you and I just, we didn't have to struggle with that. I, I told my son, I said, you know, to look at inappropriate things, we had to go over to some creepy guys. You know, everybody had a friend with a creepy dad, right? You go to that house or you got to go to some, st- you know, st- it was just, it was, it was weird when we were kids. Nowadays you click on your phone, you whatever, it's right there. Yeah. And I was telling him and Man, my son came into me. He says, "Dad, you know," he said, "I'm looking at some things that I shouldn't be looking at," and he just started sobbing. 
And I said, what was it? And it wasn't even terrible. It was just YouTube videos. But you know, as a young man, you don't want your eyes to see that. And uh, I told him, I said, I've never been more proud of you. And he's, you know, he's feeling terrible. And, I, and, I, and, I, and he said, why? I said, because you listen to the spirit of God. Yeah. And the spirit of God said, no. And, and, and he, could, he could sense the grieving of God's spirit. And that's what as parents we want to do is we don't want to like completely, you know, cage our kids in forever. Eventually we got to release them to this world that says there's no rules. There's no right or wrong. There's nothing. Oh, brother. And that's and I, and and I always like say on the parenting side, and that's what Paul is doing in Galatians. He yeah. calls them as children. He's like the dad; they're like the kids. Yeah. It's really the tone is yeah. parental. But there's a difference between raising a kid that's naive versus a kid that's innocent, right? And a lot of parents they raise naive kids, right? And that works until they leave, right? And then you know it's the gal who's 18 and goes to university and doesn't know anything and is in a relationship yeah. or in a housing situation and she didn't even see it coming, right? Because she was naive, right? And that's a failure. Yeah, and that's I think again back to Galatians to use that parenting analogy. He's looking at these new Christians he's led to Christ and he's like, I can't have you be naive. There right. are false teachers. There are dangerous people. Right. It's like you tell your kids. Hey, don't just do what every adult says. Not all the older people are safer people. Yeah. You know, like he's warning the kids. And I think that's the urgency of his tone. It's like a dad looking at his kids going, uh, you know what they do to kids over at that house? Right. Uh, this yeah. is hor- Do not go over there. Right. Well, their dad said he knows what he's doing. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm your dad. Listen to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and if they listen to this false dad, it leads to injury. Oh, so I mean, how, ma- how many guys died back then because of circumcision? Think about infection rates. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, okay. So, so since we have arrived at that issue, which is one of the issues in Galatians. Right. So we were in uh, Turkey, to, took the family to Turkey on a Bible learning trip some years ago. And there's a debate in Galatians whether they're... Only pastor's kids do vacations like that. Just well, so you know. so, okay, so I tried to make it work. So we went to the ancient sites in Turkey, and we stayed at the largest water slide park in okay, Europe. Okay, okay, okay. You get a pass on that. So during the day, we'd go like see Ephesus, and at night, it was water slides and pizza. Right. So I was like, you know, this is an American, you know, biblical yeah. exploration. Yeah. So um, we there's a debate as to whether Galatia is a people group or a place. If it is a place, it's it's probably a place in Turkey. So we went there, and one of the things there was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the Temple to Diana. And they had a Temple mm-hmm. to Diana there. There were multiple temples in the region. And so the archaeological professor, historical professor that I'm with, he says, uh, so, well, this was the temple to the fertility mm-hmm. female goddess Diana. Da, da, da. So, okay, whatever. And he's like, yeah. I said, do they have male or female priests? I just, uh, I'm, right. I'm weird to ask weird questions. Yeah. He said, well, if you were a male, to qualify for consideration, you had to castrate yourself. Hmm. You had to undo your God-given gender so that you could be a eunuch priest committed to a demon God. Right. And I was like, okay, that explains some gender confusion in our world. Right. But also when Paul in Galatians tells them, if you think circumcision gets you closer to God, why don't you go varsity and cut the whole thing off? Yeah. He may have been alluding to the ancient demonic cult mm-hmm. uh, and saying, you know what? You guys are halfway there. Mm. Yeah. Which is terrifying. Mm. Like how, mo- how many of us in our Christianity, there's things that we're saying or doing in our church that are they're, they're the half step to literally the demonic occult. Right. Yeah. But sometimes that's in the name of the Holy Spirit or a word from yeah. God or a, mm. whatever the case may be. It's all this supernatural paranormal stuff that's not the Holy Spirit. Right. Oh, man. Yeah, I love what you said. Um, there are dangerous people out there, just like there are dangerous adults, man. There are dangerous people in pulpits, and 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 people need to be so careful. Um, and the critics. Yeah. So what's happening in Galatia, what's really interesting, brother, mm. These critics didn't have a church or a movement. They were trying to steal Paul's. Yeah. And this is what happens to Jesus too. Jesus gets a crowd together and then the religious people and the critics show up and try and steal the crowd. But the crowd would never show up for the religious people and the critics. Yeah. They show up for the gospel. Mm. So Jesus brings the gospel. People show up. Paul brings the gospel. People show up. And then Satan sends counterfeit leaders, Mm. what he calls false brothers in Galatians, false apostles. And they're preaching a false gospel. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to hijack Mm. They're trying to hijack what God has done. Mm. <clears throat> and so in a church like Sandals, and 
you didn't ask me to say this and I'm your friend and I'm just here because I love you. I know what you're going to say. I'm going to pay you for it. So go. <laughs> when so many people who are lost are getting found by Jesus in right. a church. There will always be critics from the outside who are trying to hijack all or some of that people group, not to love and lead them into deeper intimacy with Jesus, but to deceive them into adding something to the simple and pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Because oftentimes, even the legalistic and critical people is, well, a lot of people are getting saved there. That must mean that they're compromised and watered down. Yeah. Which is demonic. It's what it's saying is the gospel doesn't work. And so if something is working, it certainly can't be the gospel. Yeah. I read that the gospel is the power of God to the salvation mm. of everyone who believes. Amen. It's dynamite. And when it explodes, God does incredible things. Mm. It explodes in people's lives in a glorious remaking way. And in my prayer for you and your church and your people, because I love you and I love your wife and I love your family. And, and I don't know how, you know, we haven't known each other too many years. I've seen the new auditorium under construction. I have seen the yeah. uh, church go to multiple sites. I, I have seen the baptisms increase. And, and of course, then Satan is thinking to himself, this needs to stop. And the best way to stop it would be to hijack it, to mm. pollute it, to take all these new babies and infect them mm. with something that will make them sick and unable to reproduce as they grow older. Yeah. And that's counterfeit teaching. That's the false gospel. Right. That's the demonic. Mm. You know, my kids go to Christian school and part, part of what breaks my heart is my kids have to hear from their teachers criticism of sandals or, um, you know, my son will say, his teachers will make comments about my sermons. Or, and I said, do they go to Sandals? And, he, and no, they don't. And I'm just like, I said, son, just, just put your head down. People and, echo their teachers. Yeah. And you know, in my earlier years, I'm, I've been doing this 20 some years. There were certainly times that I was out of line. I was critical. And I'll just tell you, it was out of insecurity. It was out mm -hmm. of jealousy or it was out of self-righteousness. Sometimes it's out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Like I was kind of in the reform dish world and you know, whatever. And now I'm kind of in the Pentecostal charismatic world, love them, God bless them. I've just been a Bible teacher for 20 some years, dozens of books of the Bible. My theology's never changed. But even when I hang out with my quote unquote reform friends, they'll talk about God predestined this and God predestined that and God predestined this. And, God. and then I go hang out with my charismatic friends who are actually a lot funner to hang out with. And they'll say things like, well, God's destiny for you, or you're walking in God's destiny. I'm like, you're saying the same thing different ways, yeah. We're using actually just different mm. versions of the same word. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, like, yeah. and that is that God is at work in your life and has a hope and a plan and a future for you. You can call that predestined or destiny. Right. Mm. Uh, but different traditions even use different language and criticize other people who use different words for the exact same thing. Right. Yeah. And I, and I would just tell you, you know, it, it, it is, it is really not that complicated. Right. We are sinners. Jesus is our savior. Turn from sin and trust in him. Right. But you're an evangelist at heart. Right. No, I agree. I mean, you love the Bible. You're a Bible guy. I get that. We're mm -hmm. friends. We're all good and all that. But man, your end zone is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. They Amen. walked in. They didn't know Jesus. They walked out. They know Jesus. That's your end zone. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And we call that being real with God. Yeah. Yeah. And that, no, that, and that's the point. Um, yeah, I just think over the years, I, I, I maybe I've grown sensitive to, um, and I don't mind people feeling being called somewhere. I just, I, I don't know about you. I just, I just don't encourage people from other churches to come here. I just don't. Like, I, I literally have two categories. My staff will make fun of me. I mean, like, <laughs> it's terrible, Mark. You can pray for me on this. I have two categories at the gym. You go to my church or you're lost. You go somewhere else, I'm like, I'm working out. Like, I, I mean, my pastors, they'll just like, they, I literally like, and I just walk away. But you're an evangelist. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, you know, you have other gifts as well, but it's like, you need to be, you know, so, so Paul says, you know, to a young man in the Bible, fulfill your ministry. Right. Well, leading, you know, pointing people to Jesus, that's your ministry. Yeah. You know, right. so in the, in the hospital of God, um, you're in the birth room. Right. Well, and I mean, you know, the critique I get from, you know, your friends in the reform movement and, and I've told, I'm not sure I have a lot of friends. I've by told the way. you, yeah. I've told you that we're all reformed, right? Um, is that, is my heart 
you know, um, and, and just why I don't emphasize things like election and predestination is my heart is, is I'm calling you, uh, to, to a response to the gospel. That's, that's my call. And, um, and I, I, I affirm God's sovereignty. I affirm election and all of those things, but my heart, you know, you and I've talked about it is people focus on what Paul says in God's word and they don't look at his life. Acts 13 to 28. Yeah. Is primarily about that. So we're back into Galatians. You you can read the words of Paul in Galatians and then you go over to Acts 13 through 28 and you look at the lifestyle right. and actions of Paul. Right. He's walking upwards of 20 miles a day. Right. To talk to people who are total strangers about Jesus. Yeah, amen. He's spending time in jail, and when he's in jail, he's talking to people about Jesus and writing letters to tell people about Jesus, and then having people carry the letters outside of the jail to tell people about Jesus. Yeah, amen. I mean, this is a guy who, he's not just sitting back saying, God has it all figured out. Right. What he's talking about is the means and the ends. Amen. Yeah. And God works out the ends, and he also works out the means, and we are a means to God's end. So back to Galatians, it's all about the grace of God, but we get to be the means of grace. Yeah, amen. Amen. We get to go tell somebody about Jesus, or love him, or pray for him, or buy mm-hmm. him a Bible, or invite him to church, whatever our thing is. Right. And, and the, you know, the hard folks will say, well, God doesn't need that. No, he yeah. doesn't. Yeah. But he chooses to. In the same way, when I planted a church in Scottsdale, Arizona, two and a half years ago, I did so with my wife, Grace, and our five kids because I wanted to do it together as a family to build the relationship and so that my children would know who and what I loved. Right. Amen. You know, and God invites us into a life of being messengers and ministers of grace. So we get to know our dad and we get to know who he loves Mm. and what he loves. Yeah. Amen. And he doesn't need us. Mm you know, mm. but he invites us. Right. And if you sign up for that, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a weird analogy. I, I showed up yesterday so I could come see you this morning. I stayed at the Mission Inn, mm-hmm. which is a beautiful spot. So beautiful in, hotel, thin walls. Go ahead. Thin walls and cop cars everywhere late at night. It Ooh. was like an episode of cops. It was sort of a situation. Welcome to Riverside. You and, ever heard of the TV show Breaking Bad? Yeah. Yeah. They were going to film that in Riverside. Okay. I could see that. <laughs> There was a there was a cop car that pulled over, and I think there was a guy who was on a ride along. Oh, and he got to observe everything. You know, I mean, it's kind of weird, but like ministry is with God. It's kind of like a ride along. Yeah, you get to go see where people are at and what they're doing, and you get to see Jesus change them and forgive mm. them and bless them and protect them. And God's doing all the work, but we get to be on the ride along. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. exciting. That's mm. interesting. Yeah. It's certainly not dull and boring. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, my, my heart is to see lives changed. Um, back to Galatians. Sorry, I've been all around this. Um, let's get back to the guardian. So what is the purpose of the law in our life today? Why, why read the Old Testament? Um, number one, it shows us the holiness of God. Right. That God's different. Uh, number two, it shows us our sinfulness. Mm. And, right. our, and the fact that we're not going to live up to the demands of the law, and it reveals to us our tremendous need for Jesus to come, and as he says, to fulfill the law. Mm. And so, you know, it doesn't save us, but it shows us that we need to be saved and, and who saved us. Right. Yeah. You know? So it's like for me, like um, sitting in our living room is our wedding album, mm. and the kids will open it up and look back, and they're... And the question is not, well, why do you look back? Um, because it, mm. it reminds me of, of what God has done to get us to where we are. Mm-hmm. You know, looking right. at the law is sort of looking back in the family photo album. Mm-hmm. This is where we were. Right. And this is not where we are. Isn't it amazing how far God has brought us? Right. Yeah. And it's still so sad today that, you know, people use the law to separate us and all kinds. I mean, think about there's 247 different denominations of Baptist. Yeah. And so, you know, we're so, all... I mean, I keep waiting for the left-handed Baptist and the right-handed yeah, Baptist, because oh, I was like the only group not yet subdivided. Right, oh, man, dude, we're a mess. But people fight over the law and to do all that stuff. And and again, I, th- I think you're right on the purpose of the law is to teach us how God is different and how we're called to be different, but we are not saved by the law. And so, um, oh, who wrote Spirit of the Disciplines? Uh, Willard? Yeah, Dallas Willard. So I got to meet with Dallas uh, right before he died. And, uh, you know, he's tucked back away in this office in uh, USC. And, 
you know, I think I, his secretary gave me 30 minutes and he gave me like three hours. I mean, wow. and so it was me and a couple of friends. And, um, you know, he told me, he said, the gospel is opposed to earning. It's not opposed to effort. Mm-hmm. And he just, he just subtly, he, he talked about how, how the devil has bewitched us with, I'm saved by grace, I don't do anything. And we've become the frozen chosen, you know, and we just kind of sit here and wait for heaven. And how, um, you know, the law can be things that we aspire to. And so like, for me, the issue is, is tithing. And um, um, that, that's not the issue, but that's an issue of the law. Like, do I have to tithe or not? I don't know if your people give you that question all the time. And, um, you know, I, I have a, sermon I could talk to you about, about why I tithe. Um, but, but at the end of the day, what tithing teaches me is how selfish I am with my money. And, and it's a gauge for me to look at where my heart is in terms of generosity. Um, it's a, it, it's a, what do you call it? A, it's a grace test. Yeah. Are you going to give grace? Yeah. And so, so people want to know, do I have to or not to? And, and, and I'm just like, look, man, um, I do it not because I have to, but because I want to want to. Like, I would love to tell you, I always want to give away my money. I, I want to be a generous person, but there are times where I'm stingy. And, and I know that those that is moments in my life. Like you had kids, you know, when your kids are generous as a parent, I don't know that there's anything more beautiful than seeing a kid share, a kid give. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing that breaks your heart more when a kid's like mine, yeah. you know, you're just like, God, I failed. Um, and and I know that, that the Holy Spirit in me teaches me, um, you know, Malachi 3.10, I, the Lord, your God, do not change. You know, why have you robbed me? You know, so I think the law says I'm robbing God. Grace says I'm robbing myself. I'm robbing myself of the opportunity to be generous to, you know, we haven't even got to Galatians 5 yet, right? To be, to demonstrate the fruits of the spirit. And um, and I just think that those are principles to look by and they're, and they're, they're measuring sticks, not of salvation of, or of, um, earning, but it's just, it's, it's a way for me to check myself. You know, Paul says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was in, until it, it said it there. So it's there. And it's like, okay, wh- where am I in accordance with that? So I can check my heart because I think without the law, without, without teachings of do and don't, we're just kind of floating out there. Right. And, and we yeah. need, we need benchmarks to be able to measure where we are in terms of our growth in the spirit. Um, you know, and what, what is the leading of the spirit versus What's my own passion? Well, here's what I told the folks at the Trinity Church recently. I said, uh, sometimes the difference between <clears throat> grace and works is not what you do, but why you do it and who you do it for right? or with. And so like, so I can look at you and I could say, you have to love your wife. You have to have a date night. You have to pray together. Right. You have to snuggle together. You have to go on vacation. I've just made all those laws. Mm-hmm. Or I could make those graces. You get to love your wife. You get to grow old together. You get to, you know, play with your grandkids together someday. Mm -hmm. You get to make memories. You get to enjoy her company. Uh, You get to cherish her as long as she's alive. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between a have to and a get to. Right. Oh, I agree. And so what I tell our people is you don't have to read your Bible. You get to read your Bible. God wants to talk to you. You don't have to pray. You get to pray because God wants to listen to you. You don't have to have your sins forgiven. You get to get your sins forgiven. I mean, yeah. you don't have to tell people that God loves them and there's hope for them. You get to tell them that. Right. And so, you know, grace says, I'm going to do a lot, not because I have to, but because I give to, mm. I get to, and it's motivated by love. Mm. And I think people do more for love than they do for fear. I think that's why people do more for family than they do for their job. Right. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I worked harder than anyone. I got more done than everyone, but it was not I, it was the grace of God at work in me. And Mm -hmm. it's like, so, you know, to me, the Christian life, so even like tithing, I say, you know what? That's what you have to do. What you get to do is a lot better than that. Amen. Yeah. You know, in the Old Testament said, don't commit adultery. Jesus comes along and says, you know, don't lust after other people. And you're like, okay, well, that's, that's beyond the law. Right. So I think grace actually outproduces, outperforms out accomplishes the mm-hmm. law uh, by the power of God, right? Which yeah. is not exhausting; it's actually energizing and life giving. Amen, amen, dude. It's good stuff. All right, this is the hard one. Uh, how might you apply? <laughs> You're going to love this one, Sarah and Hagar discussion in the Galatians to Christians today. I know you love this one. Yeah, I, so it's tough. It's a well, John Stott, New Testament scholar. And I don't have any notes. You got notes. So, you know, I may yeah. or may not do a good job on this. Right. You get what you pay for and I'm mm-hmm. a volunteer. So lower your expectations. Yeah, I'm going to double your salary. Yeah. Um, so in Galatians 4, he says, okay, there's a guy named Abraham and he has 
two wives and two sons, which is too many. Right. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Um, and, and what happened was they were, you know, they were old and God told them, I'm going to give you a son of a promise. It's going to be Jesus is going to bless the nations. They wait 10 years mm. and they decide, okay, God needs our help. We're going right. to take matters into our own hands. And there's a difference between God's will and God's timing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people will know God's will and they'll rush God's timing. Right. Mm. So God oh, may I've say, that. God may say, you're called to be married. And you're like, where's my spouse? There's God's timing. Right. Okay. So Sarah comes up with a crazy plan. Uh, let's get this other gal who's younger and not a believer. And uh, you can sleep with her and get her pregnant and then we'll get a son. Well, Abraham says, what a great idea. Yeah. We'll have a, you know, we'll have an open marriage. Right. Open marriage is nothing new. Right. Polygamy is nothing new. Adultery is nothing new. And it never ends well. No. That's the story of the Bible. So they have a boy, um, Ishmael. Ishmael, with Hagar. And then Sarah becomes very jealous because now she could see that her husband's heart is inclining toward the other son. The moral yeah. of the story is don't commit adultery, don't have children out of marriage. It's better to be barren and single. The whole geopolitical crisis between the Arabs and the Jews today is because one man slept with two women. Mm -hmm. And all of the Arabs descend from Ishmael as a general rule. And they follow the teachings of Islam, which retells the whole story. Differently. That yeah. Ishmael is the son of the promise and he is the he he is the hero and he is the one. Mm -hmm. And then uh and then they oppose Jews and Christians who say, No, 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 we follow from the line of Isaac. Right. So all of this to say is that uh, when you're trying to put grace and works together, mm -hmm. it's like putting Hagar and Ishmael together and and to put Hagar and Ishmael with Sarah and Isaac. Can you mm -hmm. imagine how brutal it was? Now, just imagine if you're listening to this and let's say you have kids and you're divorced mm -hmm. and you're remarried. Imagine that you all live together, your ex and your new spouse and your old kids and your new kids all under one roof. What he's saying is those who try to have Jesus and the grace of God, plus law, human religion, man-made traditions right. and works, put those together. It is the most miserable of places to live. Right. And isn't that most of our church experience? Totally. <laughs> right? That's why people hate the church. You got a bunch of miserable people trying to live according to the law who can't admit they're sinners and fall on their face and worship Jesus, right? Think about how different our worship services would be if people could just understand what Jesus did, right? Like if you, like. Uh, if we can, if, if, a, if a grown man can carry a dead pig over a chalk line. Right. And half the country leaps off the couch to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, we should be able to understand the grace of God in Jesus Christ and respond with some measure of enthusiasm. Amen. Yeah. But it's because we, we've forgotten what happened. And I just think exactly what you said is what the church is. And I think it was, it's the tension in the church of, you know, between the law and grace. And we're trying, we're trying to be married to two women. Right. And it's just like, that what doesn't work out. What a messed up, miserable family yeah. that is. Yeah. Yeah. And it ends with, right, one being left for dead. It's it's just, it's bloody and it, it's terrible. And But that's um, what a lot of people do, man. They they get saved by grace and then they want to run around mm -hmm. with law and works and man-made traditions. Right. And I'll tell you what, Jesus, we'll look at his diversity, tolerance. God looks at it as adultery. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're running around with someone else, mm -hmm. it frustrates him. Yeah. Uh. And so, you know, when you, when you put tradition at the level of scripture, when you put your denominational, religious, cultural heritage, mm. your cultural baggage, your political preferences, your little pet issue up alongside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is like, you're running around on me. Mm -hmm. That's adultery. And that yeah. doesn't help this relationship. Yeah. That's the point of, of that story, I think, in Galatians yeah, no, 4. I agree. Man, it's good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, another good one. What does it mean our hearts cry, Abba, Father, in Galatians 4, 6 through 7? So a son in that legal construct, it was a a full inheritance of the entire estate. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I didn't mean to get into all of this, but like, so the Bible says that right now we are made a little lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. But upon our resurrection from the dead, we will judge hey, amen. the angels. Yeah. 
Not only is Jesus the Son of God, if we believe in Him, we belong to Him, we occupy that position of sonship, male and female. This was a high honor for women, because in that culture, they didn't have that legal status. And what that means is when we die as the sons of God, we will receive the full inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as right now, Jesus Christ is seated on a throne. The Bible says to those who overcome, we will be seated on thrones. Yeah, plural. Mm -hmm. Alongside of the Son of God will be seated the sons of God, ruling over angels and demons and nations and kingdoms. Yeah. That's where the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear Mm. has heard, no mind can comprehend, can even comprehend the inheritance that God has for the sons of God. Dude, you're preaching. You're going to get me saved. And Come so on. what it says is, let us therefore only live up to mm-hmm. what we've only attained. Yeah. Oh, and it's geez. God's way of pulling us up into our identity for eternity and living as citizens of the king and sons of the kingdom. Mm. And, 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 and your mind just sort of explodes and your heart needs to sing. Yeah. It's incredible. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, and 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 so many of people in my church are living for six likes on Instagram. Well, and and, and in that too, <laughs> right? people people are just like, it's just, it's just so weird because you know we get bored with what God has done, and we we haven't even really yet understood what God has done. Right, I know. We're like a kid who shook the box and never took the toy out to play with it. Yeah, Uh, oh, so good, so good. Um. So Abba, right, in Aramaic, dad. daddy. Not just daddy. Yeah. So there was a guy named Jerome. I'm your nerd friend. He wrote a little article, but he says that daddy is a word that little kids would use. Dad is more that old and young. Mm-hmm. And so God is our dad. Mm. And if you're little, you'll call him daddy. But you and I, we're 40 years. Yeah. You know, how old are you? 48. 48. That's me yeah. too. Must be the perfect age. How old's your dad? 72. My dad, my pops just turned 70. Okay. Okay. And I don't call him daddy. Yeah. Uh, but when I call him, I call him pops Yeah, or dad. And I really love my dad. He's right. met Jesus. He's doing mm-hmm. great. Dad, if you're listening, I love you and I'm proud of you and look forward to seeing you soon. Um, it doesn't matter where you, whether you're young or old. Number one, you always have a dad. Mm-hmm. Number two, you always need a dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into us, what happened is in the Old Testament, they referred to God as father about 19 times. It was always national, not individual. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes along in the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, I think it is. He speaks of father 165 times. Mm -hmm. It's his number one favorite title for God, the father, Mm -hmm. for God, I should say his father. No one in the history of the world had taught that. Mm -hmm. It was revolutionary. And what it shows is this intimate, warm, affectionate. So for those of you men who are listening and you have a hard time relating to God, if you have ever held your son, Mm. God loves you like that. Mm. God is devoted to you like that. God cares for you like that. Mm. For a man, it's a radical thing to think God loves me as a son, Mm -hmm. you know, and he's my father. Mm -hmm. So Jesus teaches us to pray our father. He'll be my little riff. Um, Now you got me a little bit of preaching, but I think everybody's view of God is a projection or a rejection of the earthly father. Mm. Yeah, you and Freud. <laughs> Atheism says, yeah. I have no dad. Agnosticism said, I never met him and I'm not looking for him. Deism says, he used to be here, but he left. He lives far away. Mm-hmm. Progressivism says, my dad is more like a big brother, permissive parent, lets me do what I want. Right. Arminianism is, I, I have a dad who lets me make my own choices, doesn't tell me what to do. Reformed theology is, I have a dad who is powerful, uh, he is in charge. He's non-relational. He lives far away and don't make him mad because he can get angry really fast and hurt you. Right. Mm. And and then feminism comes along and says, let's just be raised by a single parent called God as mother. Mm. And so th- almost every theological group within Christianity is somehow a rejection or projection of their earthly father. And the problem is they're starting with their earthly father and looking up, they're not starting with their heavenly father and looking down mm. and judging their earthly fathers. Yeah. So I think I've gone so far as to say, I think the whole young restless reform movement, Time Magazine said I was one of the thought leaders that helped create that. I'm not even, I don't hold to the five points of Calvinism. I think it's garbage, but um, so blog about that. But anyways, um, because it's not biblical, but nonetheless, that whole young restless reform, God is father, but he's distant. He's mean, he's cruel. He's non-relational. He's far away. Mm. 
That's their view of their earthly father. So then they pick dead mentors, right? Spurgeon, Calvin, Luther. These are little boys with father wounds mm. who are looking for spiritual fathers. So they pick dead guys who are not going to actually get to know them or correct them. Right. And then they join networks run by other young men mm. so that they can all be brothers. There's no fathers. Right. Um, and they love, love, love Jesus because they love the story where the son is the hero mm -hmm. because they're the sons mm. with father wounds. Right. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the father but by me. Right. Jesus forgives you mm. and the father heals you. Yeah. The reason that Jesus saves you is to get you to your dad. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are forgiven and they're not healthy because they don't know their dad. Yeah. Oh, man. So if you're listening and you're new to... You're new to the debrief podcast. Uh, Mark knows this. So let me say, God is not a man. God is spirit. But we relate to God as father specifically. Barack Obama said this, that young men without a father are five times more likely to drop out of high school, nine times more likely to go to a prison and be incarcerated, and 20 times more likely to father a child and not be involved in their life. Why would God require us to call him who is a spirit father. And it's because we all need a male role model. Even ladies, 50% of women who are incarcerated today in America are women who are raised without dads. So God uh, relates to us as father because we all have a father wound. We all need fathers. We desperately, desperately need that. Men in particularly, men need a role model and a rule giver. We need both of those things. And ladies, listen to me, especially if you're a single mom, your son needs a rule giver and let me tell you something, dads crack heads and that's what dad does. And they need a relational role model. And mm -hmm. that's who he is. And, and let me just say this, ladies, if you're growing a boy and you're trying to teach a boy, and this is what's so wrong with our uh, feminine dominated culture. Or a very confused culture. Right. Pick, don't even have male and female as binary categories. Okay, yeah, that's true. Uh, but um, I think men are, a, are, there's an effemination of, of men today. And it's because... I think that uh, masculinity, and it has been sin and awful and terrible in the past, and that's not to negate that, but men need a masculine role model. And here's why. If being kind and compassionate is feminine, most men will reject it. And so that's why in the Bible, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Those are, if those are masculine properties. That's the character of Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. So, so as a man, you're telling him to be a man, you must be loving, kind, uh, joy, well, I just now I forgot all the love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, yeah, self control. Yeah. But Jesus says, if you've right. seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. Father. Yeah. So the character of Jesus is the heart of the Father. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Amen. So it's 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 not. I'm just trying to say that it's not that God is a is a biological male. It's that God is spirit. But but God God calls us to. Uh, relate to him as father because because you know there's a big debate why isn't he why isn't he mother and it's uh, Dennis Prager says because God's primary concern is to make the world a better place and and to redeem his children now he's Jewish he doesn't believe in Jesus doesn't believe in the Savior but w we need this it's just you know this reaction against why is he this well God knows what's best and he wants us to relate as that but we have we all have that father wound and that's why we have a father who is in heaven. And he heals. And he heals and he fixes and he's loving. He never leaves. He never forsakes. He right? never beats. He never abuses. Oh, man. Yeah. He's slow to anger, quick to listen, right? I mean, all these qualities that we we so desperately need. And the and and the further we're getting away from God our Father, the less fathers we have in the homes. And it's just it's just a disaster. So um And then what happens is lastly, the government steps in and says We'll do the parental response. We'll uh, feed yeah. them. We'll house them. We'll educate them. We'll, we'll raise father. them. There is no such thing as institutional fathering. Fathering is not institutional. Uh, it's personal and it's relational. Yeah. So I preached in Vietnam uh, in 2012 and they don't have churches there. So it was like a municipal auditorium. And there's this statue of Ho Chi Minh and this sign that says uh, communist Vietnam will exist for a thousand years. Well, they've almost made it 40 or 45 and they're crumbling. But you know what was right behind me? I kid you not, 10 commandments. Hmm. Number one, the government. Number two, the government. Number three, the government. And it was like, 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 it was bizarre. It's like they looked at the 10 commandments and were like, well, we got to have 10. You know, like, so God doesn't exist. The Bible's not real. But it's we, counterfeits. But we need 10. I couldn't believe it. So I'm preaching to these people in North Vietnam behind 10 false commandments of a guy who's dead. And I'm preaching about a guy who's alive. It was, it was bizarre. 
And um, let me just say this again. So the false gospel, God is mother. The real gospel is the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and we cry, Abba, Father. And just know that, that because you'd say, well, what's the difference? What, what's the difference? If we, we call him mother, we call him, it's like. God versus a demon is the difference. Yeah. And you need to know that. And it's not about, you know, you know, so, so many people, again, the false gospel today is, is we're politically active. And, you know, when Obama was in power, I had to deal with all the, you know, right wing nut jobs. Now Trump's in power. I got to deal with all my left wing nut jobs, you know, and it's like, geez, you know. Um, Can we talk about a kingdom? Yeah. And not just an election. Right. Yeah. Because what the false gospel is they believe they will make the better world a better place by getting people to agree with them politically. And it's like, look, the world changes as the gospel is, is preached. And, um, you know, it's interesting. China uh, has actually done an economic study of, of the history of the United States because they're desperate to understand why we're mm-hmm. so successful. And they came up with three things. And, and, and one is capitalism, obviously. Two is education. Number three, Christian faith. Yeah, I saw that too. Christian faith. So these are communist, atheist, Chinese people. And as they've, they've objectively looked at America, because they, they want to beat us, they, they're not trying to compliment us. They're literally saying, what are the three things that has empowered this nation? And it's those three things. And it's the, isn't it the gospel? They're like, yeah, this Christian thing, this, this inner working to do the right thing. Because one of the problems in China, as in Russia, is corruption. Totally. Now, America, we have it, but it's nowhere near like what it is there. And, um, and they just struggle. They absolutely struggle. And it's just, it, it's bizarre to me, the gospel when preached actually makes the lives of people better because even when the, the Bible's written, hey, you have a slave, but you also have a master. I mean, boom, it goes right at you. And, and you better understand one day you're gonna stand before your master. So you better treat these people like brothers mm-hmm. and sisters, boom. I mean, it's like, wow. You know, so Paul didn't try to overthrow an economic system of slavery. He said, look, you as a slave owner are now in Christ, and that person is not your property. It's your brother and your sister in Christ. And then, you know, he slaps around, um, what's his name? Uh, Philemon, right? You know, I am your father and you owe me everything. I love the line, I could remind you of this, but I won't. It's like, well, you just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul, dude, come on, man. You just did. And, and, and reminding him to accept him as a brother. Yeah. And now I'm returned to you and he's even better. And man, it's crazy. Absolutely but crazy. But it's all grace. Yeah. Yeah, man. Mm. This is good. How are we doing on time? Oh, okay. All right. So this is going to be a terrible transition, but that's it for this section. And just super excited to have you and looking forward to you guys continuing to study, continue to read. And just know, I mean, if something we've said has offended you or jarred you, go back to the you're Word welcome. of God. Yeah, you're welcome. Go back to the Word of God and just know this, man, the gospel is offensive. It, it, it is. And, and if we're never riled, we haven't listened to the real gospel.